All right, welcome to the Sweet Talk. Today is Monday, December 9th, 2019, and I am your host, Kim Matina, and I am a Google Certified Trainer and a Gold Product Expert for the Google for Education team, uh, and I am also a technology teacher. And today, I have on my show, Mr. Eric Lawson. Thanks for being on, Eric. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kim. Um, Eric is part of the um, product expert team as well for the Google for Education team. So that's how I know Eric. Um, and he is also the director of technology and libraries at York York School in Maine, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yep. So Southern part of Maine. Yep. You definitely have a lot on your plate. Um, <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And then um, I know you have a big... Um, a big topic tonight about uh, student choice and voice in the classroom and how those um, techniques can be engaging for students. So I'm really happy to hear about your techniques and how you go about um, helping teachers do that in your school. Well, thank you, Kim. I appreciate that. Yeah, I've um, been a director of tech and libraries now for about seven years. Um, but prior to that, I've been in the third, fourth and fifth grade classrooms. I've been a tech integrator. I was a curriculum admin for a while. Um, so I sort of have that coaching background, too. So that's where I kind of developed this love uh, for student choice and voice. And let me just kind of explain real quickly. Um, I would often see projects that needed tech help and it would be things like, all right, this time around, instead of doing our typical poster or trifold brochure, we're going to use technology and create a website or a web quest back in the old days. I'm dating myself a little bit with that yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> but we would have projects like that. But the problem that I kept seeing was um, the teachers would come up with that one thing and that would be what everybody did. So yeah, we were using technology to kind of enhance maybe the learning a little bit, but in the end, it was still a checklist that the students had to kind of walk through. So instead of having 10 things you had to add to your poster, you had 10 things you had to add to the website. So there wasn't a whole lot of um, enhancement in the learning. It was more of a translation rather than a, tra I mean, a more of a transition than a translation uh, to how we were using the technology. And it wasn't really moving up the SAMR model, which is what I kind of wanted to see more of. Um, so with that in mind, we kind of talked about all the different things that technology could be used for. And we talked a little bit about how you can kind of build this menu of options for students to give them a little bit of choice in not only how they're going to showcase their learning, but also how maybe they will uh, understand their learning and with standards. And then that way they can use whatever apps or technology makes the most sense to kind of broadcast their unique voice for how they learn about certain types of things, which was great. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I think giving students uh, choice gives them more ownership in uh, what they're working on um, because it just gives them more control and they picked it. So they're going to take more pride in their work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the the hardest things is that it does take more time. So it's a, it's a tough sell sometimes to teachers to say, let's move away from what you're used to doing and kind of have a templated version of the outcomes. But certainly anybody who's taken the time has seen that just what you just mentioned, that there's a lot more in the buy-in from the students and a lot more pride in the work that they do. And the quality of work then goes up a little bit higher, too, because they felt like it was theirs and not that they just did what they needed to do to appease the teacher to get the grade to meet the standard. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've learned about um, choice boards, learning menus. I've read it in Casey Bell's Shake Up Learning yeah. book. And um, that's where I kind of transitioned my teaching into choice boards, um, yeah. not only for, um, for the students, but it also helped me stay organized in what I was teaching the kids as well. So um, like I would have a choice board and then I would put the resources that I wanted the kids to reference for that choice and write for that, you know, in that table. And it just it made sense to me because that's how my brain works. Like it's more sequential or it's more ordered. Um, so I tend to use choice uh, menus or learning menus. Um, I transitioned into that mindset probably about two years ago. And I, I like it. I mean, I think it's more organized for the students too. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, I think um, certain, you know, you get to see everybody's learning style that way. It's not programmed based on one way. Um, and, and I agree with you. I think it's not just something we have to focus on with our students, but why not with our educators as well? I mean, 
we've started to look at professional development a little bit differently up here in New York and said, all right, we're, there's going to be some things that everybody has to get the same message and it's going to feel kind of programmatic, but why not have areas where they can learn um, based on their choice or based on their goals that they wrote for the beginning of the year, which is going to be individualized. I mean, if you can have every um, learner, whether they're adult or student, kind of go at their own educational plan and what they decide is their goal, what they're going to work on, you're going to see some great growth and you're going to see quality of work as well as some pride in the work. So um, you're certainly going to make enhanced uh, strides that way versus just saying, all right, everybody's going to go through this eight hour progress of, of study and we'll get to the end of it eventually. And who learned anything from it at the end? You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely think um, at least try it. Like I, I, tr I just try to tell people start simple yeah. and small and then just try it. And at least then you can make your own opinion on whether it would work for you or not. Um, because if you don't try it and you just go by what other people say, it, it's, you're not really experiencing it for yourself. So you can't come up with your own, you know, opinion, but, um, I agree. I just think that it, it, it definitely gives the kids a little bit more flexibility and ownership. Yeah. So what are some things, how do you create a choice board? Like, what are some things that you, um, like give us an example of what you're using for a choice board and like how you pushed it into, um, you know, classrooms. Yeah, sure. Do you mind if I share my screen real quick? No, that's fine. All right. Sounds good. Um, all right. So the first one, let me just make sure you can see, can you see my screen? Okay. I got to add you to the stream. Oh, there we go. Right. <laughs> yep. All right. So you should see a coastal Ridge elementary taste of innovation. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. So this is sort of how we kind of rolled this out for students. We Oh, wait, really we, quick. Close oh. your window at the bottom where it says uh, oh, Chrome yeah. OS. Gotcha. Is that there better? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, good. Glad you can see it. Um, yeah, so we were kind of developing maker spaces in our learning commons, our old traditional libraries. At the same time, we were talking about student choice and voice an awful lot. And we decided that, you know what, we're not going to be able to just roll this full out. I think you said it best, Kim. You kind of have to start with small bites. Um, and especially if we're talking about menus, that makes a lot of sense is to have sort of a tasting menu or, or small bites. Um, I'm a foodie, so I like that prefix. Appetizer. You know? Yeah, an appetizer. <laughs> yeah, get your palate wet and you want to definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely want to eat some more, right? So as we were rolling this out, we decided why are we going to try and roll it out to educators first and then to students? We might as well do it all at the same time. Um, so we have a big state uh, testing, as many of your schools do in March area most years. So we decided that during state testing, we would open up our learning commons, our newly designed library and our maker space. And we kind of came up with this idea of taste of innovation. So we took um, some main courses and desserts. And as you can see, the tech uh, coach, Annette Sloan, I have to give a, a shout out to her. I'll, I'll throw her uh, Twitter handle in the notes as well. She sort of helped develop this idea <clears throat> of all the different things that you could do in order to try and um, boost some student choice and voice. <clears throat> and it started off, honestly, with butcher block paper in the hallways of our schools and students decided to try and, um, and, and we had community members as well. They wrote down things they saw in the school that we could do a better job of. It wasn't necessarily problems, but it was things that uh, maybe if we tweaked or did something else, it might make it a little bit better. And we kind of developed that from George Kuros's, um innovators mindset by trying to develop problem finders as well as problem solvers. And I think that's a big part of that choice in voice. Um, again, you can have students kind of choose how they want to present their learning, but that's just one aspect of it. We really want to have them kind of choose how they're learning as well as just presenting the learning at the end of the unit, if that makes sense. Yep, yep. Um, so this is sort of what we came up with, and, and she kind of nailed it, I think, with some of the things that we did and just, just a few of the ideas that came out of it to get kids to try certain things with, you know, building a catapult or, or marshmallow towers to build some engineering in, paper bag challenges, for instance. We did have some genius hour time. Um, we also had some tour builder, which unfortunately is starting to deprecate, <laughs> but we had some of these tools that people hadn't tried before. And we were going to let them just try it out after testing so that they got an idea. Now, that was just sort of a foundation of, you know, get get those appetites wet, try, try and build some interest so that then when we get into the actual uh, meat of the other curriculums, the kids can then decide how they would like to learn about things and how they'd like to present their learning because they already sort of had that idea of what the tools could do. So is this something that you do? 
in the library? Well, yeah, we have one of my in my innovator project uh, when I left the it was then the teacher academy. I'm dating myself again because I went to London in 2014. But um, one of the innovator projects that I'm doing is building maker spaces across our district and as much as I can in our state. So I've done a lot of talks on, you know, kind of recreating the idea of a traditional library. And instead of being all about consumption, also having some creation and building maker space areas or if you have room in the school itself to build a maker space, um, have those opportunities for kids so that they can build and create and get creative. So that- you, so the teacher comes into the library and this is what you have on the, the computers for the kids to pick from to, to do. Right? Yeah, we have it both digitally and we have it analog too. We'll have it on posters and things so that um, teachers can have it. We also have built out carts so that if they can't get to the library itself, they can be more mobile and bring things into the classrooms. So, you know, really flexible as far as where these things can um, take place. So is this, do a te- does a teacher come in like during one class period or like how often do they have to come to finish uh, a task on this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we get asked that an awful lot when I present on this. It honestly can depend on sort of the teachers and the students idea of the whole project and the scope of it, but also, you know, case by case, certain projects are going to take longer than others. And that's the thing with a tasting menu, it was meant to be quick hitters so that they understand what's going on and they could leave it after 20, 30 minutes and that's it. Um, But certainly as we've developed the program, there are kids that come back, you know, once a week to two, three times a week, depending on how much their project really takes up the time and that they work out with in a plan. We want to make sure we stress that they don't just come down and start working. There's always a plan, whether it's a storyboard or written proposal or, or auditory, depending on Uh, the need of the student. Um, We have that all set up and agreed upon first with the librarians in the, in the learning commons and also the classroom teachers. So that there's sort of this um, idea behind what's going to happen and and some responsibility of making sure we hit deadlines as well. So do you find kids coming into the learning commons um, on their own time? Yeah, that's the intent was once we get past the introduction phase, we certainly have kids coming in um, either both to the maker space, which can be curtained off from the library, but also into the learning commons with facilitation help to get those projects done. And they do okay. it. Independently. So now let's let's talk about the space. So the sure. space, who manages the space? Yeah, great question. Let me uh, stop screen sharing for a second because that was getting crazy. Um So great question. When the teacher first decides, hey, I want to introduce the kids to the space, they often will come down with a whole group and we'll do something like a paper bag challenge where everybody gets the same amount of materials, same time frame, but you're on your own to solve a problem. And that's sort of a quick way to just jumpstart kids into thinking a little bit differently than here's the checklist I have to go through to hand in my assignment. And then after they've done that once or twice, and they do that in the um, learning commons as well, because in our elementary schools anyway, they are dropped off. That's part of the allied art schedule. So they get that sort of maker opportunity at least um, a couple times in a quarter. Often it's once every two weeks um, in our earliest elementary school. So that by the time they've had that introduction, then they can kind of come in and independently work on it. And it's often the um, learning common staff that kind of focuses on on that. Um, my friend Tom Roop, actually, I'll do a shout out to him too and throw his Twitter handle in here. Um, at the middle school, we have a tech playground, which is down the hallway um, from the library in the Learning Commons. So he will facilitate some of that work as well if there's a higher tech need just because of the space within our buildings. So does he come up with the challenges or does it co- or is it a collaborative process with the teacher, him or the librarian? We really want to stress collaboration. So it isn't necessarily that one person comes up with the idea. We'll we'll try and either get grade level notes, curriculum maps, something that sparks an interest. And it doesn't matter if it comes from the student, the classroom teacher, the learning commons specialist, or somebody on the tech team. We just kind of want to throw the idea out there and then collaboratively we work together to find out like, what is it that you want to accomplish? What types of things can we support with if there's a tech need? And then what's the time and sequence and scope of this so that we can manage this in an effective way? So do you feel that this space is being utilized, um, you know, during the week? Like if you had if you had to scale it from, you know, like one to five, five being like, you know, most mostly used all the time and one being the least, how would you scale it? 
Uh, that's a great question. It can depend on the school for sure. Uh, at the high school, I would say it's not as used as much as you trickle down to the grade levels, the elementary schools being the ones that use it the most. Um, the trick though, and, and this is what we fell into, we were monitoring and measuring our success based on how much the physical space was being used. And then we realized that the mindset is actually a bigger um, piece to the whole puzzle than the space, the physical the mindset space. for who though? For, for maker space for both the um, teachers and the students, okay. but more for the educators, I would say. Students want to do it all the time. I mean, you know, they'd scrap whatever curriculum if they could get in there and build because that's exciting to them. It's different. Um, the educators and sometimes school committee or administrators will say, well, how much time are you taking? That looks an awful lot like indoor recess. Where's the curriculum aspect, which that's the harder sell. Um, but once we got there, now we're not necessarily measuring growth based on how often the space is used, but more what are the quality projects that kids are creating that we used to just assess those standards with more of a traditional method. Okay. Because that's that's hard, like <clears throat> the buy-in from the educators. Like yep. it's, it's challenging enough for educators today to actually go into the library just to do whatever they do in their research and, and, you know, um, you know, yep. work on different papers or whatever, or even like, it's hard to even come into the technology lab sometimes because they're so packed, jam packed with getting their curriculum done. Yeah. No, you I know. So it's hard to, it's hard to try to convince people to take, time out of their teaching to go into a makerspace. Like I get it. I, yeah. I'm not the one you have to convince. Right. Right. But no. I have to do the convincing sometimes. And, and it's challenging. Like, you know, they, they, the teachers have really no time in their schedule to alleviate for things like this. And, and I really feel like it's a shame because I think the kids need to be exposed more to the computing skills critical thinking, yeah. problem solving, you know, um, logical thinking, you know, creativity. They just, sometimes they, they lack in that. And those are the skills that they need afterwards in life, you know? Yeah, and that's that's what we were finding. I mean, you're absolutely right. You, you're talking about makerspace for most people means a lot more time and a lot more supplies, which means money and who's going to facilitate it. And there's a lot of red flags right away in education because not everybody can do that. Um, we were lucky in a way that we had this ridiculously aging uh, computer lab in our earliest elementary school. And I brought it up to the staff. I said, look, we can do what we've always done. I can revamp that computer lab again and we just keep doing it. Or we can spend the money completely creatively. And we had a, a number of workshops where I just pulled the staff in and said, what if we tried this? What if we tried that? Had them brainstorm some ideas. And that's ultimately how we came up with our creation station at our earliest elementary school, which is now the, the student maker space. So about the space now, so what do you have in that space that like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure it's open and it's got tables where the kids can stand and sit and work, but what else do you have in there for the kids to? Yep. Great question. Flexibility was the key. Um, so we had a, a number of donations from local businesses, which certainly helped because that was the number one thing is how much money is this going to cost to start up? And we really, we wanted a soft rollout to start with and something that grew organically so that we could prove that it was going to work first before we then went out for extra money um, to the taxpayers. Cause that was the last thing we wanted to do is say, let's try this out and have it not work out to the best uh, of everybody's abilities. Um, so we had tables that were built by a local lumber company that was low to the floor for kids, but it also has shelving so that you can have a lot of storage. Everything's on wheels. So that's completely flexible. Um, a teacher may say, all right, I'm, I'm want to come in and basically do a science lab. Can you build it like this? And we have some templates of what the room could look like, but ultimately we can push everything off to the side and make it wide open or completely compact everything. We have the um, retractable electricity hanging from the ceiling. So you can just pull down electricity if you need for tools. And that's what we did with our first grant was we said, we're not going to buy anything consumable with our grants. We're going to buy everything that we can reuse over and over again. So we bought tools and glue guns. Um, things like that so that the students would have all of that. And then we just reached out to parents and community members for a lot of the consumables that are, you know, covered with what looks like an arts and crafts store or a Michael store that just exploded in our, in our space. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. And we were able to really organize it with some other um, smaller donations, just with plastic tubs from Walmart so that, um, you know, we can just kind of have everything ready to go and, and easily inventory. Cause that was our first issue. 
when we rolled out was everybody wanted in and we weren't going to be able to keep supplying everything with what was going out. So now we have sort of a, an accountability where the kids come in, they say what the project's going to do as long as it lines up with their plan. They, they list off all the supplies they're going to use so that we can kind of keep a, you know, sort of this ongoing list of what's being used. And then that way we can reach out to those entities and say, here's what's the, you know, the popular items of the month. Could we have those replenished, but we don't necessarily need paper towel rolls anymore for yeah. instance. Something yeah. like that. So your, your, your maker space is more, um, I don't want to say arts and craft, but that kind of materials, it doesn't have any um, tech gadgets in there. We try and grow it out. So, you know, the first thing everybody said is, oh, you got to have, you know, Glowforges and 3D printers in your K1 makerspace. And it was like, well, okay, maybe not. Maybe we need to grow this out a little bit so that if you were to come into York and see our first elementary school, it is going to be more hands-on arts and crafts. Although we have some tech in there, there's an interactive whiteboard and a projector and some Chromebooks so that kids can look up things or demonstrate things. Um, but for the most part, it's going to be more tangible, hands-on materials, almost like an arts and crafts kind of thing. As they grow older, more and more tech is constantly introduced. Um, so we start with like Ozobots and some robotics once you get to the two, three, four. And then by middle school, like I said, it becomes more of a tech playground in one area and a makerspace off the learning commons in another area. Um, that's where they start to learn more about um, engineering as well in seventh and eighth grade. So that by the time they're in high school, we have full on robotics teams and things like that working in our um, steam wing of the of the school. OK, yeah, yeah cause it, it, you kind of you kind of said it nicely. It sounds like it's really it's really going well for you because you have like the elementary students working more, like you said, with arts and crafts and then gradually working them way up to um, like the tech the tech playground. You know what? And your school district is K-12. It is K-12. Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That was what we wanted to look at was not necessarily like um, how do we fund it supply wise, but how does it make sense? Right. I mean, if the kids in K-1 are going to get so stuck on the, the technology or the even the staff at that point, the technology and it's taking hours and hours to print something in 3D, is that going to be something they're going to utilize a lot? And the answer for us was no. I, I get it that other school districts that works out great for them. And that's awesome. I'd, you know, I love seeing that. But um, for us, it was more if we could get the tangible stuff and here's a paper bag with, you know, eight supplies you're used to now create something completely new out of it. We were getting a lot more engagement out of that than trying to showcase how we could bring in, you know, heavy robotics or 3D printers or things like that at that early stage. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, you know, at yeah. that grade level. Like I'm in middle school, so yeah. I'm dying for a 3D printer. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, hear you. I actually think I'm going to be getting one, which really oh, makes nice. me happy. Yeah. So that'll be a whole learning curve. But the reason why I want to get that is so that the kids can actually create their own uh, make their own creations like in Tinkercad yeah. and then we yeah. can print it out. So for me, that's part of like, you know, engineering and, and design to a certain degree, you know what Absolutely. I mean? Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, uh, drafting and dimensions and measurements and everything like that. So it all ties in. And then when it prints, you have a little 3d. Yeah. That's you know, perfect. Creation. So like for me, that's the component that, for me is missing, which um, I know my supervisor is going to be getting me one. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, That's excellent. I just, I just want the kids to be exposed to it. So, um, yeah. you know, that they have that kind of con those concepts of when they go into high school, at least they could say, Oh yeah, we did this. I right. did this already, you know, cause you yeah. really just want to introduce them to, the concepts or the skills. Exactly. And, and we've actually seen a slight in, um, increase in enrollment in our AutoCAD classes and things like that at our high school due to, I, I would believe, some of that introduction earlier on. You know, kids are choosing those paths to go into more of that engineering idea. That and it's, it's you know, popular right now too, for sure. But um, some of that certainly was, you know, we'd like to dabble in that, but I don't necessarily want to be uh, on the trip to the vocal Vogue school or something like that, if I haven't even had a chance to introduce, you know, get an introduction into it. So I think, you know, we were trying to be as strategic as possible with how that looked K to 12. Yeah, that that's, I really like that. That's, um, that's awesome. And then, so you bring in your, you have your maker space and then you bring mm -hmm. in your choice and uh, choice boards and student voice. So how do the students actually present this? Like they get to use the tech or do they actually present 
um, old fashioned public. A little speaking. bit of a little bit of both. Do you mind if I share screen again? Yeah, go ahead. All right, all right, sounds good. Um, yeah, so if I bring up, I'll, I have a few examples of, and let me oh, just. I gotta quote. add it. All right. There we go. Okay. So um, as I said before, do you see the tasting menu now? Yes. Okay, so similar to our taste of innovation, often if teachers are just looking at a quick way to get started, we'll kind of present something like this. It's just a quick tasting menu. Hey, to start with, sketch your idea, record your idea. Here's a few of the apps that we've used and we have tutorial videos and case studies and uses and examples for it. So if they have questions, they can look at that. Um, you know, then sharing in, in your progress, there's some tools there as well so that, you know, as they have checkpoints along the way, they can use those types of tools. And again, these aren't the only ones. We always say that you can, you know, certainly order off menu as we like to say, if a kid has this great idea, but um, often if you leave it wide open, some people struggle to get started. So that's why we kind of dictated a few that we've used in the past. Um, and then we like to call dessert sort of the reflection period. So now that you've finished, <laughs> what types of things would you, um, you know, like to reflect on and here's some of the tools that we've used in the past as well that just sort of builds on that so they can kind of see that. Yeah, I like this um, because it's it's not overwhelming. The other the other document that you showed before, yeah, it's it was a, a little it was a lot. There was a yeah. lot here. This is just beginning, middle, and boom, I'm done. Pick right. one in each each section and then you're done. Would you mind if you um, shared a copy of this with the sure. viewers? Or yeah, if you wanted to make a copy of the template and uh, shared it. That I like this um, this style, and yeah. I like that. Just it's cut and dry. Sketch your idea. Use Lucid Chart, Jamboard, or drawings. Record your idea. Flipgrid, Wii Video, or Soundtrap. It's just yeah. it's it's right there. Like there's no. And that's what we're going for. I like I like just catches your eye and it's simple. Yeah. To the point. That's what the kids need. Right. And, and this one kind of curbs that idea of this is going to take a ton of time, because if you look at this list and you're familiar with any of the tools, it's not going to take a ton of time. You, you could do something quick and short and do it more often throughout the year so that they build some mastery, not only with the tools, but understanding which tool is going to work best for them when they then voice their uh, presentation, sort of their progress along the way and then their reflection in the end. Yeah, I, I agree. I definitely agree. This is this was great. I'm glad that you were able to share this because, um, like I said to you, I just started changing my teaching style and I used the choice menus and learning menus and I really enjoy it. So, and, it, and again, it keeps me organized as well as trying to keep the kids organized too. So yeah, for me, it works, but you know, it's, it's, Definitely something that is a mindset. You have to try it. Start small, take baby steps, and then, you know, give it a shot and see how your kids respond. Yeah, exactly. And that I means similar to this going on that tasting menu, I developed this quick little kids menu um, sort of like for elementary menu. school. Yeah. And, and, you know, with this one, it was sort of, okay, you've tried this starter a couple of times. Why don't you try the next starter for the next project so that it wasn't, all right, one project a year or two projects a year, we're going to pull out this menu. It's let's let's use this menu over and over again throughout the year so that you can kind of dabble and understand one, what's maybe your favorite tool, but two, what tool is going to match sort of your learning style or how you want to present your learning or even match your learning the best possible. And where do you put these learning menus in Google Classroom, I'm assuming, right? Uh, we do in Google Classroom, but I've also built a website. And again, I can certainly share that with you um, just on student choice and voice. And we have several of these menus. Okay, cool. Yeah, that would be great. And then really quick before you uh, topic sure. here, do you have a subscription for these tools or are these tools um, being used as the free version? A good question. So many of them we use just the free version, like with Padlet and some of those. And then the other ones like Nearpod and things that we've kind of ramped up, we've got a subscription to. Um, you know, we often talk about the apps can be ridiculously overwhelming. So how do we go about them? And, and you know, um, again, I'll just do a quick little screen share. I promise it won't take too, too long. Um, when I present sort of apps, do you see this uh, woman overwhelmed by apps being collapsed on yeah. top of her? Okay. So when I talk about apps, we often talk about, in my eyes, there's three types of apps. There's the one-off apps, what I like to call the chocolate covered broccoli apps, and then the evergreen apps. Let me just quickly explain. The one-off apps are things like the Oregon Trail. 
right? You're going to use it for maybe one specific curriculum in one specific grade level. It works for that. But other than that, you're not going to use it over and over again. It's good, but it's not my favorite. Um, the chocolate covered broccoli apps, or as uh, Wikipedia likes to call it, the edutainment, um, feels like something that the kids want to use a lot, but there's maybe some meat um, to it in the end or, or some protein to it. And that's sort of like the math blaster, right? They're taking that worksheet of, of rote skills. They're gamifying a little bit. It looks pretty cool to kids, but they're still sort of getting those skills. And the last one for me is the evergreen apps that can be used over and over again. And in York, these are the ones that we like to subscribe to. We get to the point where the free version is great, but if we could buy the premium, we're going to do that. And, and that's why um, we've sort of vetted those because we're going to use them over and over again across the curriculum. It's not going to be this one and done. That's good. I'm glad I asked that question now, you know, because <laughs> sometimes now you have the other question about the COPPA regulations with elementary students. So you, you kind of are forced to buy the subscription because you're dealing with, you know, kids under 12, yeah. um, middle school and high school is a little different. Right. Um, but yeah, so you, you do have to, uh, consider that when you're, when you're using all of these apps and, and I like that one slide that you had with the lady with all the apps icons around there, because it does, it gets very overwhelming. And then yeah. you're like, well, this app does the same thing as this app. So why don't I just use what I know? Why do I have to change, you know? So right. it, it's, you have to, you know, feel comfortable with it, do what you feel comfortable with, and then start small and then work your way up. But if you don't try it, you're, you're actually cheating yourself out of um, a great mindset and learning style or teaching yeah. style, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, thanks, Eric, for being on today. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me, Kim. I um I really would like if you can share those that um that uh, presentation that you just had you sure. showed Absolutely. in the show notes because um I might borrow that and yeah, share absolutely. It with my Deal with right. my uh, staff and stuff. So I know if I want to share it, maybe somebody else may want to use it as well. Of course, with credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> But I'm going to wrap up the show. So let me share my screen. All right. All right. You let me know if you can see my screen now. All right. All right. Sounds good. You can see it? Yeah, I can. Yep. All right. So if you'd like to visit my website, you can go to the sweettalk.com. And that's the S U I T E talk.com. And you can see um, the latest episode will be here on the homepage. And uh, if you'd like to be a guest on my show, you can fill out the guest form and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, you can talk about anything that you feel comfortable with as long as it can help other educators in the classroom. Um, and believe it or not, I'm scheduling for March right now. I can't believe it. Wow. Um, so, uh, and if you'd like to see any past episodes, you can go to the episode and podcast list and you can see all of the episodes that I have here. Um, the YouTube link will be here in the show notes or wake collection. So that'll all be here as well. And please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Join my Facebook group. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter as well. And I am also on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, and Google Podcasts. So um, please join the Sweet Talk community. I would really have like having you on. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen. There we are. <laughs> and kudos to StreamYard again. Thank you for making yeah. this interface uh, so easy to use. And uh, I really love it. So thank you, StreamYard. Um, and again, thank you, Eric, for being on, sharing thank your you. expertise. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> and I will see yeah. you soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> you know, wow. we've been trying to hook up for months now, so <laughs> true. It's, true. Been, it's been fun. But Crazy I'm good. glad that you came on and shared because I think it was important and uh, it was a great topic. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. And I will see you in a minute. Don't right. you hang up on me. All right. I will. I promise. <laughs> Let me end it. Right. Bye, guys. <laughs>